there were ultimately around 1,700 P-80s built. Um, it was the United States' first viable jet fighter, becoming everything the Defense Department had hoped that the P-59 was going to be. The P-80 was the fastest jet aircraft for a brief period, having flown 623 miles per hour by Colonel Albert Boyd on June 19, 1947. It also broke the record from New York to L.A. Uh, Colonel William H. Council flew a P-80 nonstop across the country to make the first transcontinental jet flight. The 2,457 miles took just 4 hours and 13 minutes at an average speed of 584 miles per hour. And that was on June the 23rd, 1946. Obviously, this plane is important to the United States Air Force history. Um, so let's take a look at the history behind the P-80 shooting star. The initial order for the P-80 came straight from Hap Arnold's mouth. He contacted Kelly Johnson of Lockheed and gave him a proposition to build a jet plane. The only catch was it had to be delivered in 180 days and kept absolutely secret. And that happened in June of 1943. Kelly agreed um, and took complete control of the project from Lockheed. His, his stipulation was if he was going to, to do the plane that he wanted to handpick his team of engineers from the company. And um, they, they moved the project to a separate building in downtown Burbank, California from the, from the other Lockheed plant. Kelly was a hard-nosed, demanding, and very brilliant engineer. The project was kept so secret that out of about 130 people working on it, only five actually knew that they were building a jet plane. One of the engineers on the team referred to the project as Skunk Works, which was a reference to a popular cartoon at the time having a super secret moonshine still deep in the woods to keep it a secret from everyone. The British engineer who actually delivered the engine for the plane was actually detained by police because Lockheed officials could not vouch for him. So that's how secret they were keeping this project. It was it was, it was, a, it was basically an early black ops project, the same as the Stealth, the SR-71, etc., The aircraft was designed around the Halliford H-1 jet engine, which was later renamed the Goblin 1 um, when it was built by de Havilland. Uh, the team actually didn't have access to the engine at the time of the aircraft's construction because it was still in England. There was only two of them in existence. Um, they hadn't got it yet. So obviously that, that's, a, that's a pretty big issue, designing a plane and building it without the engine. Um, the plane was built and delivered in only 143 days, even though they had a 180-day deadline. The first prototype delivered to uh, Merrick Airfield on um, November the 16th, 1943. It was called Lulu Bell. The testing was delayed further after the Goblin 1 engine had been made into the plane because the engine actually sucked in a foreign object and it was completely destroyed. So they had to wait until the second engine could be shipped to them from Britain, which was the only one left in existence. And they actually had to take it out of one of their own prototype planes to ship it to the United States. So I'm sure they were really happy about that. The first prototype was called Lulu Bell, um, or the Green Hornet, because they had been painted green. Um, it cost about $550,000 to produce. The plane first flew on January 8, 1944, by Lockheed test pilot Milo Burkham. Following the flight, Kelly Johnson said it was a magnificent success, um, such a success that it had overcome the temporary advantage the Germans had gained from years of preliminary research on jet planes. Um, in test flights, the XP-80, which is what the, the prototypes were called, the XP-80, eventually reached a top speed of 502 miles per hour in level flight. It was actually the first uh, Amer aircraft to accomplish this. The second prototype, des designated the XP-80A, was designed for the larger GE I-40 engine, which was an improved version of the J-31. Two prototype XP-80As were built. Initial test flights were not that impressive, but most of the issues were soon corrected. But opinions of the test pilots were not very positive, particularly Milo Burkham. He remarked that an aircraft he once enjoyed had become a dog. And that's because the XP-80As were mainly test aircraft designed especially to test the largest of the new jet engines, so they had become a bit bigger and 25% more heavy than the regular XP-80. The XP-80 test program turned out to be pretty dangerous actually uh milo burkham was killed on october the 20th 1944 while flying the yp-80a the second yp-80a was lost on march the 20th 1945 even though the pilot escaped he broke his back while bailing out um, world war ii's best test pilot 
Major Richard Bong was killed on the first flight of the production P-80 on August the 6th, 1945. Berkham and Bong both crashed as a result of the fuel pump failing. It, it wasn't necessarily the fault of the plane. They hadn't become familiar enough with the controls yet. They actually had backup fuel pumps, but they didn't know that. So they didn't turn them on whenever the primary pump failed. The YP-80As began to enter service uh, late 1944 with 12 pre-production YP-80As. Uh, four were sent to Europe for operational testing. Two were sent to England, and um, two of them got sent to Italy. But when test pilot Major Fred Borgotti died in a crash caused by an engine fire on January 28, 1945 at RAF Burtonwood, the YP-80A was grounded temporarily until they could figure out what was causing the unreliability. Um... The two YP-80As in Italy did conduct a couple missions, actually, during February and March 1945, but due to delays in delivery, the P-80A or the P-80 actually saw no combat during World War II. Um, the initial order was for 344 P-80s after the um, U.S. Army Air Force acceptance in February 1945. A total of 83 P-80s had been delivered by July and 45 were sent to the 412th Fighters Group at Merck Army Airfield. Um, production continued after the war, but the wartime plan for 5,000 planes had shrank to 2,000 due to the shrinking of the defense budget. A total of around 1,700 P-80s were actually produced by the time production halted in 1950. Um, but beginning in June 1945, several P-80s were transferred to the Navy, and they flew to the Navy Air Station Pawtuxet to be modified for Navy experimentation with deployment on an aircraft carrier. So the planes were loaded onto the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt um, on October 31st, 1945. Um, the next day, the planes made four deck run takeoffs and two catapult launches with five arrested landings. Even though the Navy had already begun getting its own specific jet aircraft, the slow pace of delivery was actually causing them to have trouble with um, keeping pilots. They were actually flying really old propeller planes um, still. Um, they wanted to fly jets though. So to set their pilots, to get their pilots some experience with jet aircraft, they received 50 F-80s, which by this point, it's the Air Force is there, so the plane was redesignated to F-80. Um, they received 50 of them in 1949 as jet trainers. So that way their, their pilots could get experience with, uh, with jets. Shooting Stars first saw combat in the Korean War. The F-80 flew both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground sorties, claiming several victories over Korean Yak-9s. On November the 8th, 1950, the first American claim for a jet versus jet aerial kill was made when Lieutenant Russell Brown, uh, flying an F-80, shot down a MiG-15. Soviet records showed that the MiG survived the encounter, but I mean, you can take from that what you want. The Soviets, a lot of times, would cover up things to make themselves look superior, etc., the F-80 definitely was at a speed disadvantage uh, compared to the MiG-15. That's not even debatable. Um, the MiG-15 actually employed a lot of design techniques that they had gotten from German research that they had captured right after the end of the, the war um, that showed the advantages of swept wing design. The F-80 obviously had straight wings. The F-80 claimed victories over six MiG-15s during the war. Um, they were later restricted to strictly ground attack operations due to the F-86 Sabre coming online and being a, ma a good matchup for the MiG-15s. Of the 277 F-80s lost in combat in Korea, which is, I mean, that's a ton of planes, 113 were lost to ground fire and 14 to enemy aircraft. Um, F-80s were credited with destroying 17 aircraft in air-to-air -air combat and 24 on the ground. Um, Major Charles Loring Jr. was posthumously rewarded the Medal of Honor for his actions while flying the F-80 on November 22, 1952 in Korea. The F-80 had an armament of six 50 caliber guns and eight 5-inch rockets that were actually fired out of the nose from pods. Um, the max speed was 580 miles per hour. The cruising speed was, three, was 437 miles per hour. Uh, it had about a range of a little over a thousand miles. The ceiling was forty six thousand eight hundred feet. It weighed or the the max weight was sixteen thousand eight hundred and fifty six pounds. 
Um, it began to be phased out in 1951. Obviously, the Sabres and a, a few other fighters had come online that were just, I mean, this it was outclassed. Uh, and it was com- completely removed from active service by 1958. It actually served a while in the Air National Guard and stuff like that up until uh, 1958. Um, there were actually eight F-80s converted to radio-controlled drones in 1951 under a project known as Bad Boy. The drones were designated um, the Lockheed QF-80. The armament was all completely taken out and radio control equipment was installed. All of the pilot's controls, they, they left in the plane, so that way that the uh, the planes can still be operated, manned or unmanned. And a second batch of 14 drones featured larger center mount Fletcher wingtip tanks, but they were equipped with cameras rather than fuel, so that they could basically film attacking aircraft um, during testing. Um, these cameras could be jettisoned by a remote control, and uh, they just floated down on a parachute. The company that, that did all this uh, conversion was called Sperry, and um, later they received orders for 55 more QF-80s. On, uh, ni- in 1954, the drones were usually painted red. Um, some of the QF-80 drones were in operation as late as 1962, actually. Many of them were operated as pilotless drones to collect radioactive samples from mushroom clouds during nuclear tests, so they would actually fly the plane through the cloud. Um, obviously you wouldn't want to pilot. They actually used to put monkeys and, uh, and mice and things like that inside the jet to, to see what the effects of the uh, bomb would be on, on living tissue. Um, during the Korean war, an F-80 was actually captured and was reportedly used to harass UN troops on the ground. That's, that's pretty interesting. Um, in the summer of 1945, approximately 30 P-80s were sent aboard an aircraft carrier in the Philippines in preparation for the final assault on Japan. But the planes were uh, the planes were actually shipped without their wingtip tanks or the batteries. So they had to sit on board the aircraft carrier for about 30, 30 days or so, and they were just sitting there waiting for their equipment to be sent out. And by the time it actually arrived, the war had ended. Um, after the war, the U.S. Army Air Force compared the P-80 to the the ME-262, which is what it was kind of designed to fight, really. And that's why it was rushing to production so quick. Um, they concluded that the ME-262 was pretty much superior in acceleration, speed, and had approximately the same climb rate, despite being m- over a ton heavier than the P-80. So the Messerschmitt ME-262 was just still a superior plane to the P-80. Um, that's pretty much... I mean, at that point, it was... It's kind of hard to justify that plane being the flagship because the, that German plane was designed in the early 1940s and it was superior from, from birth, basically. Um, so, But the P-80, you know, it, it contributed and it filled a gap between the World War II era technology and, you know, the later F-86 Sabres and stuff like that. So it's an important piece of aviation history. And um, I'm, I'm was happy to make a video about it.